Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar from the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society. I'm Adai Halbeck, and I'll be the chair of the webinar today. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. If you have any questions for the speaker, you can type it in the questions pane. So you should see some panes or panels, and you'll see that there's a questions one. If you use the text box there, you can type the questions for her. Um, and then just take note that we are recording the webinar. So we will also make the link available to you once it becomes available. So with that, I would like to present our wonderful speaker. So Karen Yang leads the AI, AI products at Labelbox and help enterprises iterate and produce AI models. Previously, she created intelligent warehouse picking robots as first software engineer at Covariant.ai and built the perception and hand tracking features of Oculus VR at Meta. During her master's study, she worked at Stanford IPRL lab on the intersection of language models and robotics research. So without further ado, Corin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Halbeck, for that introduction. And thanks everyone here uh, who tune in or later on listen to the recording of this webinar. And today I'm very excited to share with you um, some of my you know, knowledge and thinking around um, some of the latest AI advancements and how I think it is uh, going to affect the business world. Um, so today's lecture is going to have a little bit of technical over, uh, you know, walk through an overview, but the majority of the um, um, session is going to be about exploring the potential of, you know, the most recent AI advancements as well as the challenges that we uh, were facing in actually productionizing it. So I think um, we already heard a bit of myself. I have some research experience in vision, robotics, and reinforcement learning, and a little bit of language um, modeling exposure. Uh, when I last researched at Stanford, um, also have you know real world product and engineering experiences at several different companies, um, and currently I'm helping a lot of enterprise teams building their um, AI projects, their AI models um, at um, a startup called Labelbox, where they um, build this data platform to help them from labeling to using models. So personally, I have seen. Um, you know, a lot of companies are um, how they advance in the last couple of months with the huge waves of large language models, large generative image models, and um, the industry is actually moving very fast and very exciting as well. So I'm um, excited to share some of uh, my learning in that. And today the agenda is going to start with um, maybe more technical primer um, on some of the recent models in uh, vision and language. Um, and they're actually fusing together a lot more these days. A lot of models are trained on both. So very, um, I think it's important to see how they're built and how to use them. And then we can dive into some of the busy uh, business use cases. That is, you know, we're still at the early stage to figure out what are the power power uh, of these models and what are the you know risks of these models. And there are a lot of you know, movements in the business world already. So we're going to see some examples of that. Um, I'm going to talk about why I think today building um, commercial AI use cases become much simpler than ever before. And there's a reason why so many people jump into this because it's much more ready to be commercialized. Um, and then following that, I will talk about some of the production stack of uh, using those models. And lastly, we'll talk about remaining challenges. There's still a lot of challenges because it's such an early field. So first, let's um, get a quick walkthrough on some of the foundation models. Um, we're focusing on foundation models, but um, you know, all of these models came a long way. We're all standing on the shoulders of the giants. Um, there's like decades of machine learning history that will take forever to talk about. So today, I'm just gonna focus on the things that rolled out in the last two, three years. Um, that is a class of model we call foundation models. Um, you know, it is a term that's coined by some Stanford um, 
research team at their human centered um, AI center. Uh, but essentially, it describes the kind of machine learning models that are usually really, really large. Um, they're very large at scale. They consume a lot of training data, um, like the data from the internet um, or um, a lot of data um, that is crowdsourced. Um, and then they often use self supervision or some of the very efficient uh, method efficient in terms of you don't need a lot of human labeling effort. Um, that's why they're able to gather all the training data. And because the model has trained on so much, um, it is able to generalize very well to a variety of data patterns um, of the real world. So um, after, after that, it is much easier to do either transfer learning of these models to you know, a new task, or sometimes these models just perform really well out of the box. An example is you know, GPT, which I think most people are very familiar with by now. It performs very well to most of the, many of the novel tasks that we ask them. It's not perfect, but it's pretty impressive how much, um, how many different tasks it is able to handle. Um, so that's foundation models. And there are, um, like I kind of split them into you know, mostly for image applications and for language. And here are some uh, recent examples of the um, image computer vision models that's trained to do multiple tasks. Um, so starting from the top left, uh, Florence is a model released by Microsoft research team um, about two years ago. It is at the time one of the largest model that uh, trained on both uh, images, videos, and their captions. So it understand the semantic meaning of the images and the text related with it, and they use this to adapt to a lot of computer vision tasks. And the result of this is that it can generalize to many new tasks very easily. And a similar thing, you know, two years later, this is from Google. They, they released a model called Vision Transformer that is 22 billion parameters, which is humongous. Um, and as you can see, it is able to um, do very good captioning of very weird images. Um, that is, you know, even challenging for a human to describe. But because this model is being so big, um, it is able to generate really interesting, accurate, and funny uh, captions for these weird images. And here are like more focus on, you know, predictive tasks like classification, captioning. Um, in the middle section, we have, you know, the generative models. Um, they are they are trained not to predict um, the classification, but they are trained to have the generative power. Usually, you start from um, you can start from um, you know a tech, natural language description of what you want the images to be, um, and it generate really realistic or really artistic images that looks really good. You know, looks really good at least one out of ten times. I'm, I'm sure a lot of these pictures are cherry picked, but when they do. Uh, well, it does really, um, really astonishing artistic results. Um, examples are DALI and Midjourney. There are some other models that is able to take it, like if you draw a sketch, um, it is able to turn a sketch into a much more fancy artistic image as well. So these models are really cool and have a lot of potential, um, you know, which I'm going to talk about later in, uh, you know, the world of marketing and gaming and uh, artistic creation. Um, and the third type of model is a model that is very good at object detections. And here is a recent model from um, Facebook Meta Research called Segment Anything Sand Model. And it, um, it learns, it's trained on 11 million images and billions of masks. Um, so, and it's able to generalize to any kind of objects. So it learns what a notion of what objects are, which is something that I think humans are very good at picking out this is um, this is a plant. This is an orange. This is a knife. We intrinsically know that, but it was always a very challenging problem for computer vision um, on very general objects. But it is able to do that very well and accurately. Um, so a lot of advancements in image, and um, we also want to talk about you know a quick walkthrough of the transformer-based foundation models for language. Most of the language models we see that are powerful nowadays are based on this transformer architecture. Um, essentially, it is a um, it's built on top of you know self-attention blocks based on this paper called "Attention is All You Need" um, with with um, you know a transformer block. Um, you can uh, learn about um, you know the 
each word's semantic meaning as well as its relationship with every other word around it. Um, and the transformer is very parallelizable, making it very easy, much easier to train um, at a larger scale. And the GPT-3 is essentially um, 96 of the transformer architecture blocks. Each of them have 96 attention hats. So they're just a giant blob of transformers stacked on top of each other. And here is you know, a quick, um, this is like a detail of how a, a, a tension block inside the transformer look like. This is just the thinking machines so are just two word input, but this could be arbitrarily long sequence. Essentially what it's doing is that every input will have its embedding. It will also, the model also contains, um, you know, other, you know, learnable parameters, queries, keys, and values. And those things are used to um, compute a score about how relevant this word, this word is uh, in relationship with all the other words in the sequence. And after doing some arithmetic um, here, it will compute a general value of what the, um, this word is. And this value actually encapsulates multiple meaning. It usually contains the semantic meaning of this word in the context of the sequence. It also um, probably involves a lot of other language modeling things um, including what usually comes after this word, what are some, um, you know, grammar, and um, as well as, you know, you know, semantic meaning, which might contain um, sometimes a word have multiple semantic meanings. And overall, this is a way to um, kind of consider all of the context uh, and understand very long context of text. And it's also all just linear algebra, like matrix multiplication, so it's relatively easier to parallelize compared to their predecessors, which are RNNs, which are recursive and um, a lot harder to do the parallelization. So with this, this is kind of the foundation of all of the you know cool models out there. And you know here on the left side, here's a plot of you know how this simple structure is enabling all of the most popular language model we see today. And since 2018, the scale of these models in terms of parameters are ha they have um, is growing exponentially every year and uh, much more than Moore's law as well. Um, so as you can see, we can almost fit a, you know, um, a exponential curve on them. Um, and as a model gets larger and larger, um, people also find that at a certain scale, or at least these are, you know, Google researchers and open air researchers believe that at a certain scale, there is a significant qualitative change in the model's capability to handle more complex tasks. And the, the plot on the right um, describes, you know, um, you know, whether the, ability, the, the model's ability to perform multi-step arithmetics, um, you know, you know, GPT can do math nowadays or simple calculation. It is not always correct but it is sometimes very correct like adding you know 10 digit, 10 digit number to another 10 digit number it can do it um so that is something that we just never heard of a couple of years ago but now we have much larger models it suddenly somehow captures how to do that um and this, the middle talks about you know college level exams like ACT for the American students. Um, it's talking about the um, the scores of these models on these college level exams, and you know I'm seeing that some of them can even handle like medical exams or legal exams um, that is supposed to be really challenging as the model gets larger and larger. Um, and then, of course, it's getting better at understanding semantic words, um, the meaning of the words in a uh, context. And we all see significant improves, you know, as the model scale gets larger. So people are saying there's something, some correlation with the model's scale, with um, how powerful the model is. That's a hypothesis uh, that we have today. Um, but at the same time, you know, models are really getting really large nowadays, and it's really used up a lot of the training data, almost entire internet's data. So um, is it going to get even larger? Um, I'm, 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 I'm unclear, um, but definitely it's becoming like a giant play. Um, and by the way, it doesn't mean that every model has to be this huge. 
very uh, later on in the session, I'm going to talk about you know a few a lot of successes in recent couple months of how to distill these big models into much smaller models and fine tune on your data, um, and you can get pretty good results with much smaller models too. So um, and so here is like kind of the models themselves, and what is the training process to get good results? Um, apparently. You know, the vanilla transformer um, is trained with self-supervised learning. Basically, you have a massive corpus, like the, all of the uh, text data on the internet, and you kind of mask out some words, like just mask them out, and you, you let the model to guess what those words are. And this is what we call self-supervised learning. Um, and the model is simply predicting the missing words. And by doing that, surprisingly, it is able to build, and you know, the model is able to learn general language modeling, semantic knowledge, it's able to learn grammar um, and some reasoning capabilities. Um, so this is kind of the baseline of foundation models. And I think GPT-2 and GPT-3 are trained in this fashion. But starting with ChatGPT, um, it is starting, you know, it, people find that these kind of models, even when they might learn generic language modeling, they don't always give you really good results. And sometimes they give you know, hallucinate a lot, give you, you know, incorrect or even harmful um, outputs. And this is why the training, um, you know, this is from OpenAI, they're inventing, they invented a few new training steps to help mitigate that issue. So one of them is called instruction tuning, or um, it's, a, it's a way of supervised learning. Basically, you know, I tell the model, here are some, you know, instruction inputs, here are my expected outputs, and you should learn to behave like these examples. This is a form of supervised or imitation learning, um, you can call it. And basically, the model now understands what is a golden standard of you know, a good output. So if it sees similar um, prompts, similar input, it will be able to uh, learn that. And ideally, it might not behave in a very toxic or um, very uh, harmful way. Um, so trying to put it in like some fixed trajectory. And sometimes that's that's still not enough. Um, and to further improve the model's um, kind of understanding of what really is good and what really is bad, um, there's another technique called reinforcement, reinforcement learning from human feedback. It's also introduced by OpenAI um, folks. So essentially, um, they train in a second model and that model is called a reward model. This model's goal is to learn what is a good output and what is a bad output and you know, give you a score, uh, maybe from zero to one, to indicate how good the output is. That model is trained with reinforcement learning by having human um, basically having you know, some up, some down on you know, model outputs or providing you know, ranking choices between one model output versus the other. So it ranked them, or gave them a score accordingly. And this model, reward model, would generate a score, a numeric score. And that score becomes a loss function, becomes a loss um, to, to go back to the original, um, um, original language model and use that as a signal to further fine tune it. So these two model approach, you're basically learning a model to generate loss Function, uh, rewards as a loss to train the previous model is called reinforcement learning from human feedback. And this really helps the, the model to understand what is a good output, what is a convincing, helpful uh, output, and what is a bad one. Um, things that are toxic, fake, aggressive, repetitive, and all the other um, bad behaviors. Um, and this is what takes ChatGPT um, and GPT-4, I'm sure, to the next level. And after that, the final thing is that um, you know, so once those big models are trained, how say I, I'm interested in building a model myself and I wanted to learn about you know, my task and my data and I would need task specific fine tuning. In this fine tuning, there are a lot of ways. You know, the simplest way is that providing some example in the prompt, what we call prompt engineering, um, in the, you know, just embed it in the input. Sometimes model can pick up the pattern from that. From that, but if the um, kind of the pattern I want to learn is more complex or my data is more special, you might need additional instruction tuning or uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback techniques um, to further fine tune it to a um, particular task. So here's an example. As in prompt engineering, become very important for um, I would say both the language foundational models as well as the um, um, 
even for the image ones, you have to do really good prompting to make sure it generate good images. But here's an example that focuses on um, the language part. Um, so a good prompt engineering, you know, you can ask, you know, GPT anything like write me a joke, write me a poem. Sure, it will give you some some example. But usually in a say in the business use cases or um, kind of personal assistant chatbot use cases, you want um, kind of specific patterns of results. And this is why you need to have good prompt engineering. And for example, the instructions part is where you kind of set up the context. You're a good math assistant. You're going to help me with my math homework. Um, and when you don't know, don't hallucinate answer. Just say you don't know, right? I don't want you to hallucinate answer and fool me. So, and then what's been proven to be very helpful, what I just said, is to add some few shot examples directly in the input prompt. Um, here is an example. Uh, here is the context. Uh, setting up the math problem here's a question and this is the expected answer and i want you to answer in a similar fashion as this example so you can add a few more examples um, and then you um, and then you provide the context and question to the model and the model is going to give you the answer from here so this has been proven to be like a good prompt engineering um, people end up actually do spend a lot of time on it it's it's not a linear search process um, with a lot of, it requires some trials and errors, but this is kind of like a good template for you know, building a math, a math assistant for, for kids. Um, one note here though, is that every model has a limited size, token size for the prompt plus the output size. So for ChatGPT, it has 4,097 tokens, and that's about you know, somewhere around 3,000 English words. Um, different languages are tokenized in different different ways, um, and the largest model today, I think Anthropic Cloudy now, can support up to 100,000 tokens um, in the input size. So it's not a limited size. You cannot crank all of the examples here. You have to be very smart about the limited space you have to tell the model you what you want it to do. And that's been um, you know, a design constraint for a lot of use cases as well, which we'll see later. Um, and now um, I would like to talk about some bit early business use cases for foundation models. Um, and um, I think this is the exciting part. Um, there are a, a, a ton of use cases. So starting with image models. Um, so if you see um, earlier, the image model basically becomes really good. They're very good at even zero shot image classification, detection, and segmentation. And there's a lot of use cases uh, about, about this. Um, from for the kind of business perspective, the things that I can think of is that there's a lot of you know, e-commerce company, like a fashion company or even grocery company, grocery, um, you know, online shopping companies want automatic product tagging. So it's better for people to search for it. People want content moderation on social media um, about images and videos to make sure there's no harmful content. They can use this as well. Um, in manufacturing and logistics, there's a lot of things you can detect. Um, and sometimes models are better than human. And of course, in security, in medical uh, imaging, as well as in robotics, autonomous driving, and AR, VR, all of this that requires image input can now be, you know, can now have like a 90 5% plus accuracy model to help you do these tasks, um, which is a lot better than the previous um, benchmark. So these are commercial ready. Um, and then another trend in uh, image models is that the generative models make, a, make it possible to do very creative work. So creators uh, who are, um, it could be an artist, it could be a game developer, uh, or you can just be um, you know, amateurs that want to generate some cool photos. On the left side is a new product from Adobe called Firefly. As you can see, you can select a part, it automatically figure out the segmentation, interesting objects there, and it can generate some other different styles uh, so that you that look still seamlessly work well with the background image that allow you to change your design slightly. Um, so that's really cool. It's an image in painting and editing techniques. On the right side is um, this one is from Lensa. Lensa is you know really popular on social media, on TikTok for a while, and they generate a lot of income by 
you know, simply this is a iPhone app or Android app that lets you upload some of your own um, photos, your own selfies. And this, you know, the three pictures of this man is probably actually from someone's photos, but it turned it into really cool artistic, you know, studio quality photo shoots um, that looks um, really, really awesome. Um, it will be much harder to actually do a photo shoot or have professional artists build this for you, but AI can just do this um, with an app right now. This, this is probably more of a style transfer um, techniques that uh, the modern image models can do with very high fidelity. Um, and of course, you can gen directly generate images and video from just a description. And here are some examples like Midjourney, which is one of the one of the most popular uh, image generation platform, can generate things from really cool um, posters to like even house design, or um, you know fashion design or gaming assets design. And in the middle, there's some startups starting to use this actively for gaming design. So game developers. Uh, don't need to look for unique ass assets. They can just get one from AI. And we can even, there's even more recent development in the text to video. So given a text, you can actually generate not just one image, but a video. As you can see, the video quality is still not the best. There's a lot of, you know, um, kind of instability in by, between the frames. Sometimes it shakes around a little bit. It's not entirely clear, you know, whether it's realistic. But in abstract sense, it's getting a lot better um, than before. This was unthinkable uh, maybe two years ago to have text to video generation. And in um, talking about language models, there's um, a ton of cool use cases with um, kind of the newly unlocked capabilities. Uh, one of them, which I personally find really uh, cool, is the ability to write code. Um, several stats on this. So GitHub launches Copilot, which is their coding assistant that help you do autocomplete of your code. And I think um, I think within one month, they had 400K users paying a pretty high price per year. And they have A-B tested with some of their user. They show about 30% pro uh, productivity increase. So imagine you have a coding assistant uh, to help you do a booster productivity by 30%. That's quite a lot. Um, and another interesting side effect of this is Stack Overflow, which is a very common forum for um, developers to look for answers. Like, this one has a bug. How do I solve this? The traffic of this website is going down a lot because people can now just ask Copilot or they can ask GPT, and they will have a customized, you know, debugging um, result for you to help you debug so people don't have to ask on, you know, Stack Overflow. So maybe a bad thing for that, but I think this is a really cool thing that shows, you know, how how potentially useful this can be for developers. Um, and uh, several other data is that GPT-4 has a record of 67% accuracy on some uh, new Python programming problems in a new data set that people create. These are things that they've not seen in a, in a original training data set. These are new problems but is able to do 67% of them. So it's probably better than, you know, average, you know, human developers at this point. Um, several, you know, interesting trends in the code writing ability, um, you know, the things you can do, there's a lot of, um, you know, you can just ask it to write a function or write a, like a backend function for you. You can ask it to write a SQL query for you or a Unix command for you. Um, and um, it's not always accurate, um, but you can, you know, if it's not accurate, you know, it goes to the next next kind of uh, bullet point, which is, you know, if you copy paste the error messages back to um, maybe the, the the AI, the GPT, it will look at the error message and it will try to self-correct itself because it has the ability to incorporate the past information and additional information. And sometimes it can figure out how to debug for itself. And it can also help you explain what goes wrong, how to debug it, or how to improve it. Um, and it can also be helpful for code transformation. If you're trying to learn a new language with a familiarity with an old language, you might ask it to translate a function from, say, JavaScript to Python or vice versa, because you know they're really good at translation in general. So translating between code is also something you can do. So personally, I've used 
you know, this ability to write some of my, you know, simple coding things is works sometimes in if you tell exactly what to do in a small setting i don't think it can design the infrastructure or design an object interface but it's pretty good if you wanted to do a simple command or like a regex match query for example it's really great at that um, another interesting trend that i see is that people are using language model to power the new search tool or new research tool um, left side is Coda or Notion. You know, there are some um, kind of enterprise noble companies that want to power their CRMs, uh, right? So you you have a list of prospects, their names and the companies, and you can hit a button and it will automatically do all the search about these people for you and enrich it with what is their role, what is their um, um, or like search in your software to look for revenue and things like that. So it was able to populate a, a lot of data for you. Um, and in the middle is a company called Perplexity. They're a startup that is trying to be the next generation Google search. And their results, you can ask them, here's my, I asked them, what is foundation model? And it gives me, you know, a, sum, a pretty good summarization about what it is. And, um, and it kind of, figure out how to solve the problem of, you know, sometimes model hallucinates. So here, not only do they say it, it also gave me the fact checking ability. It's telling me where does each sentence, um, um, you know, where's the information coming from? It will cite the relevant sources for me. So make the results more credible. And on the right side, it's like very good for researchers and students. Um, these are uh, this called, this called illicit. So this is great for searching for papers, searching for relevant papers, and summarizing the papers for me. So if you're doing a new research, um, you might want to summarize the abstracts of each paper um, to see the rel relevancy. And the relevancy is probably more based on semantics than it's based on you know just the title. <clears throat> so that's really cool. And beyond that, of course, language models are really good at extracting information um, or even do analysis on information. For example, you could, on the left side is a kind of someone's demo about um, a financial assistant chatbot. You can ask them what are the cells this month that will tell you, they will do the SQL command um, in your database. And it was able to tell you the answer and is able to also uh, write code to generate a plot. So you can see the plot as well. So, you know, things, something like this might be very interesting to financial analysts um, where people want to summarize their data in a visual data focused way. And in the middle, um, you know, a lot of people get excited about adding GPT ability in Excel and you can do a lot of things. For example, you can, you know, say list a, a lot of people's name and you can generate a personalized and maybe list what, um, what they're, you know, what they like or what they're about and you can generalize a personalized message for them based on the context you give it. And this has been useful for maybe salespeople, maybe for people who want to personalize the messages to their friends. Um, it's very good at personalization given context. Um, and of course, it's very useful for um, generating or brainstorming your marketing copy. And um, there are few, there are quite a few startups in the space where their primary goal is to help marketers um, write better marketing blogs or write better ads copy. Um, so, or at least provide a pretty good first draft of it um, or write better product descriptions. So, um, you can just tell it what your product is like and it can figure out a very engaging and um, convincing way um, to describe it and you know providing a, a few different terms that you can choose to do you want it to feel more funny or more you know um, friendly and things like that so all of these abilities um, are really um, kind of there's a lot of i personally think there's a lot of like um Creativity um, and your creativity is the ceiling here. There's um, a lot of cool use cases that people are building with it. And lastly, um, well not lastly, like, and there's another kind of very important use cases for language model that's been the case way before foundation models are are was a thing, and that is like the ability to understand documents, text, and um, comments or audio and conversations. So I think enterprises have been 
working on this since um, you know many many years, things like two decades ago potentially, and now with a large, large language model, it just gets another upgrade, right? Right now, it's very easy without you don't even need any training data potentially to do sentiment analysis, predicting the trend. Um, we probably can process your documents if you're working in a financial company, legal company, medical companies who luckily have a lot of documents like credit card application or um, medical records and things like that. Um, and you're able to use this model to help you process uh, what information do you want to extract out of it. You can ask any question about those documents. Um, and this can automate a lot of manual process um, that you know these companies face. Um, that's like it's what they think is their operational um, overhead. And lastly, um, in like say in medical domain, like for conversation or for people's say people's meetings uh, or pe people's meeting with other um, say you're selling something to other companies who often record your sales meeting or if you're a patient or you're a doctor looking at patient, you also sometimes record those. These can help you write documentation later um, um, to do better you know, summarization of your sales meeting or do billing of your insurance from the medical conversation. And there are products that can you know, turn those audio into, <coughs> into text. And from the text, you can um, have a really good summarization in a structured way. And last but not least, chatbots. Of course, chatbots are the most obvious thing for language models because they're trained um, on chat and they're trained with human chatting with it uh, a lot of times. So it's really good at conversations. And um, here, the examples here are one of them is the you know GPT-4 from OpenAI that contains plugins. So not only is a um, language model. It also can talk to third-party services such as OpenTable. This is a service in the U.S. that can help you book restaurant reservations. I can understand, you know, can you get me a restaurant suggestion? Um, and it will understand, you know, I need to use this tool to make a reservation for you. Um, and it's like making the chatbot not just a chatbot, but actually do useful things for you, like an assistant or a, person, a personal assistant or a executive assistant um, for work settings. Um, on the right side, it's another similar assistance that's built by Cajon Academy, which is a, a nonprofit educational platform with, um, with the goal of having a personalized tutor for, for kids to learn about STEM. Um, education things. That's another area where language model can be very powerful on, especially now that it also understands math and some programming. I, I do see, and um, um, I do see it becoming very, you know, promising to help uh, in the education domain, help people learn better with more personal attention um, with it. So that's like a lot of information about different use cases. Um, so um, there's a lot to build and every day, sometimes I go on you know, Twitter or go to news, I saw a lot of new, you know, great cool demos out there um, and people are very excited about it. And I, and I think different from before, the barrier of entry to building this really cool AI use cases become much simpler today. And, and why is that? Why is the barrier become much lower than before? Um, so, um, and maybe everyone can, with some basic understanding of um, basic programming, uh, or maybe not even basic programming, because there's a lot of graphical interface out there as well, can probably build um, something for, for their own use case to help with their own work and life. Um, one of the major reasons, the biggest reason, is there are abundance of APIs out there. Um, the big, large language models out there that are hosted behind an API that is very easy to use. It's just sitting at a REST endpoint that you can just hit um, and use it and a return result in a reasonable time frame. Um, there are also a lot of open source alternatives that also have pretty good performance, um, but with probably much smaller model, smaller, probably smaller um, uh, environmental impact as well as like uh, less cost um, if you use a much smaller model and because some of those models are small enough that you can host itself and it's open source so potentially you remove the privacy concerns um, 
For example, if I want to train a model that you know help me write emails for me, I might opt for an open source model that I train and I host on my on my end so that my email data never get exposed to uh, one of these big companies. Um, um, on the left side, there are some commercial APIs uh, of hosted foundation models. These are going to be the best models and largest models out there. They're trained with you know billions of parameters and took multiple months and millions of dollars, literally, to train them. Um, and these guys really do have the cutting edge models out there uh, for you to use. And it's very easy to use. On the right side, um, there's you know there uh, there are big open source community that are very excited about um, fine tuning um, smaller models on top of some open source alternative. And like within a couple months of uh, the first one of those is from Facebook research, they open source a model called Llama and got leaked somewhere um, with BigTorrent. And like two weeks later, you know, researchers like from, from academics as well as just, you know, engineers from all over the world was able to build a fine-tuned version of those and was able to open source these models and the performance are getting really close to um, you know the really huge foundation models from the big big companies so we can see there's a trend of these these models catching up and giving people more options of how they want to use the models um, and another thing is you don't need a lot of effort or money to collect data and fine-tune the model anymore a lot of these models are pretty good such that you know you might just be able to use them out of the box without changing much or you do some prompt engineering which does not require fine tuning you're just adding a few prompts to help the model guide through um, the the inference process and that doesn't cost you any money to fine tune the model and say if you do want to fine tune a model you have a very unique data set a very unique you know re requirement for what the output should look like um, there are a lot of open source as well as um, enterprise solution to help you fine tune a model with only hundreds of data examples or maybe thousands of data examples. And this is a lot better from before where you need maybe hundreds of thousands of examples to train something from ground up. These models are so transfer transferable that you only need a much smaller um, data sample to do that. Um, and another thing is once you collect data, say you collect some data, um, to label in order to fine tune, the labeling process today can likely be automate, largely automated by some models, right? Instead of labeling them from ground up, you can let a model label it your, uh, for you, give you the first draft, and then you have a human expert doing the quality assurance or modify it a little bit. So maybe you can save a lot of work just for that. The whole loop of collecting data and fine tuning the model become much shorter than before and the cost is reduced, I mean, depending on what you use. Fine-tuning a GPT-4 was still probably going to be expensive, but um, it will be in the order of hundreds or thousands rather than, you know, training a model from ground up, which takes um, easily 10 times, 100 times more than that. There's also uh, more mature infrastructure available for, um, you know, new ML, um, kind of enthusiasts to start experimenting and productionize their machine learning models. The cloud computing platforms are very mature and they even have um, you know, hosted fine-tuning solutions and inference solutions for you. So you can start from there. There's a lot of you know, community resources uh, shared online about open source models, libraries, and frameworks that you could use. And here's just some examples um, um, that I've, you know, a, there are a lot of hackathons um, about a large language model and foundation models lately where people coming in without too much knowledge about how to use it but within like a day of work most people is able to build an, a demo it's not productionized but it's a demo that's like working end-to-end -end with input and output um, with very minimal stack that they need because the tools are so good so i think there's um, much lower barrier now for people to enter ai um, and do the proof of concepts on um, these foundation models on your own unique data um, and interesting use cases. Um, so what I want to talk about next is that you know maybe it's not too hard to build a demo, but it's never going to be easy to get this working into productions. Um, and here is you know some examples I draw of what a production AI could look like um, on a high level. 
Um, the first step you usually need is data collection preparation. Um, you know, you might not even need to do that if you just want to use the model out of the box. But say if you want to do it, um, um, you still need to get your input. Say I want to process my email or process my PDFs. I still need to build connectors and pre-processing stuff for my data. And there's a lot of like connectors out there. Lenchain is one of them that has good libraries for those. And there's a lot of them out there, um, libraries for free to use. Um, and if you actually want to do labeling, there's a lot of labeling platform out there that combines with automation to help you curate a really good training set um, to good quality um, and avoid low quality repetitive data. And these tools and softwares out there are becoming really mature. Um, and then I think the most interesting part, and I think this is where the you know creators of um, AI use cases will spend most of their time on is to experiment and try out different architecture, different prompts, different models, or fine tune some models to, to work on um, an end-to-end -end use case. So oftentimes the model is just one component of the whole picture. Um, the model just has a user prompt input and an output, but usually to make an application that's helpful, you need to give it a few additional software components. Here, what you see is, you know, what a, a simple chatbot like ChatGPT requires. It requires a memory of the past conversations. Uh, your chat history is actually, uh, you know, recorded and appended to the user prompt to the model every time you ask a new question. And because of this memory component, it is able to understand the context you've talked about before. Um, and this process, you know, the user prompt is where, you know, as a creator, you need to do a lot of evaluation and experimentation adding some prompt engineering, adding some examples to improve it. So, you know, even if like a most basic chatbot interface, it requires um, creative engineering of the prompt, as well as, you know, a memory structure to store um, the past context. And here is another very common structure that people are using today. So this one concerns, um, remember earlier we talked about each model have a very limited token size, um, input size input and output size. The token size actually count both the input and output. And for ChatGPT, it's only like four, seven tokens, less than three, seven words. And, you know, if I have a book, if I have a list of web pages that I want the model to remember and help me do question and answering, or I want the, the model to be able to, you know, grab anything from a database to answer my questions, how is the model going to fit all of those contexts in? There's just no way to put all of them in a prompt. So here is, you know, another component that is critical to um, help the model connect to a much larger um, database or sources of information and use them as um, a way to help you answer a more targeted questions. So for example, if I want to say, I want the model to index all the web pages on um, all the documentation of a particular library I'm using, I would want to use a vector database, and there's a few da vector databases out there, I would use a vector databases to index all of those web pages um, into vectors that's stored in a database, so that when I'm actually asking a question to the system, I will, you know, ask a question in the prompt, and the prompt will be converted to a text embedding, it's a vector, and the vector databases, which is what it is, is going to pull out the K nearest the neighbors that close that most closely match to the question I'm answering. Um, and the assumption here is when I'm asking a question, the most relevant um, text stored in databases is most likely to answer my question well. I'm only going to select maybe like top five, top six of them, so so that the model does not explode its context size. Um, and once you do that, you assemble those top five results into the prompt itself. Um, so you will combine the original question uh, and you will add on top of, you know, the top match it, matched results and that together becomes a prompt. A model look at that and will then be able to access the most relevant information and to compose uh, a right answer for you. So this structure, you know, requires additional component called um, vector databases. And in reality, it's been, um, it's kind of pretty, because the model's context size 4K is pretty limited, it's very crucial for most business application to have a vector database like this. Um, it, 
it matters to if you want to do Q&A, if you want to do search across all of your data, if you want to, you know, query databases in um, uh, in other places, this uh, this vector DB is needed to store this information and append it to the prompts uh, in real time. And now we're going to talk about something that's even more complicated and even more kind of ambitious for the models. You want to be able to experiment. Um, like people are starting to chain the models with, you know, they, you have one instance of a model answer the first question, and you want to chain the result of the first model to other language models to solve sequential questions. Um, and this is kind of the concept of what we call an agent. So the agent not only, it's not just like a one turn, one state where you ask the question, get the results. Once you get the results, it can trigger a few other things. Um, like for example, uh, if you ask in this example, it takes, um, you know, it figures out, um, you know, you know, the model cannot solve the question, you know, in the first go. It needs to ask follow-up questions uh, to itself, such as how long does each trip takes? And, and then it figures out, um, you know, it composes the task into subtasks and um, a sub-question and, you know, use the same language model instance to answer the sub-questions again and at the end compose the answer together. So um, this makes the model, you know, answer more complicated question that requires multi-step reasoning. And what's even more complicated is that um, people are starting to give language model software tools. Um, so for example, this is an example from, uh, on the left side, it's a, it's a paper from, I think, Google called React, which is, um, you know, the model is not only uh, answering the question, it's thinking. After seeing the question is thinking, what action do I need to take? Sometimes, you know, in order to answer a question, I need to do a Google search. Sometimes in order to answer a question, I need to do maybe connect to another software and get some other information to help me understand the, the, the question better. So they turn this problem into, you know, a, a set of steps to take and it will execute those steps one by one. And every time it finish one step, it will determine what tool to use and what next thing to do. And this makes them more helpful as an assistant because it's reason, it's both reasoning and acting step by step. Um, as a uh, and maintain such state. On the right side, there's um, kind of a open source project called AutoGPT. Um, it is probably more complicated. It has like, you know, a task queue it gives itself. Essentially, if you ask a question, say, how help me solve global warming? Um, like I asked a question before, um, just like, it's a very generic, very high statement, and there's a very much open-ended um, research question. And what AutoGPT agent will do is that it will look at the question and say, okay, to understand how to solve global warming, first I need to do, I need to think about step by step, what tasks do I need to do? First, I need to understand um, what are causing global warming. Second, I need to, need to understand which organizations or companies are, you know, in power of changing it so that in the future I need to talk to them to collaborate on this. And third, maybe, you know, is I need to actually have a task of writing those emails and communication and have those coalitions. And then for each task, it will go to execute them. And once the results come back, it will think about new tasks to do. So this becomes like um, a cassette of a lot of tasks that execute on its own. It just keep going on and on. Um, so people say, wow, this is really cool. This can just be a very autonomous agent that can help you accomplish really complex questions. Uh, it does have that potential, but I have to say my, my real experience of using it is sometimes a model like go off rail a little bit or have wrong answer at certain points and just make it completely not usable. Um, but this is such an early effort. So I think there's a lot of potential there to improve the agent autonomy of uh, models. Um, the next, um, say, I think fine tuning and deployment models, this one will be optional. Um, but if you want a smaller model, um, here are some example of, um, you know, how you can fine tune a model. This one, um, Alpaca is a model that is fine tuned by, um, Stanford research groups. They took the open AI model, um, and use it to generate a lot of instruction data examples as the, you know, so, uh, as the supervision, um, signals. 
and they took the open source model of uh, Meta's Llama and they used that to instruction fine tune the Meta. Um, so Alpaca model actually performs, you know, close to ChatGPT, but it's much smaller and much cheaper to train. I think the cost is within hundreds of dollars. And so that makes it commercially available to have your own version of the model um, to use for your applications. And there are some crazy people, not, not crazy people, they're very, you know, cool um, engineering uh, enthusiasts out there that is, you know, making the Llama model running on, you know, um, hardware such as a MacBook, such as a, a phone uh, right now. So these are no GPU solutions, but they use a lot of cool techniques such as quantization and compression of the model to make them fit into a CPU of your phone and laptop. So we can potentially see a future that we can run these models on smaller devices. Um, last but not least, I think to build an ad application, uh, you really need to think hard on the UI and UX. Um, it's almost hard, as hard as the prompt tuning um, and uh, the context because you want to abstract those things away from the end users who might not be experts in tuning the prompts or machine learning. You also need to think about the responses because the model usually takes longer to get the results back than a normal search usually only take a sub-second, but model can take multiple seconds up to a minute. And you also want to design a system such that it allows user to get feedback or can self-correct mistakes because this will happen one out of five times or one out of ten times. It does happen frequently enough that you need to design a system that allows for those errors. Um, in the last um, four minutes, I'm going to talk about some remaining challenges. Um, biggest challenge um, in um, this is, in my opinion, is the alignment. How do we make sure the, the model's output is not toxic, violent, inappropriate, or deceiving? And I think it could be potentially be a big risk for our society or for our personal work or for, um, for company, for the public image to um, have models that generate really terrible results. Um, two ways to, um, two of the ways, um, there's an active uh, areas of research, two ways to help with that. One is you know, adding on more fact checking to everything the model outputs. So the, the model uh, needs to learn that what is, uh, it needs to learn from a pool of evidences or a source of truths, and it's able to generate a score for itself to say whether the thing it's saying is right or wrong. And on the right side, another technique is that sometimes you can use a model to check for the model's responses. This one is published by Anthropic. They have a model called Constitution Model. What it does is it's actually a model that critiques the main model to say, given the um, main model's output, identify whether the responses is harmful or not. If it is harmful, it will tell it how do you correct it. And the main model upon receiving those critique will readjust its uh, output and build a new output to um, give it to users. So for example, if you ask, can you help me hack into my neighbor's Wi-Fi, which is probably a terrible thing to do. Um, and after the critique and revision, it eventually say, uh, says, hacking to your neighbor's Wi-Fi is an invasion of her privacy, and I strongly advise against it, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you don't have these in check, it might actually you know, really go look for ways to help you hack into your neighbor's Wi-Fi, which is not great. Another challenge I see is you know, testing and monitoring. Uh, language models are intrinsically ambiguous, and there's no deterministic behavior. So testing and monitoring for those is going to be quite challenging. Um, and there are many places that a model can go you know, terribly or wrong or fail um, in a way that's hard to be, be, cat, uh, be caught. Sometimes the model will just give you inappropriate results or has hallucinate something out of nowhere. Sometimes maybe other parts of the stack, like the vector database gives you, you know, not great match uh, search results. Uh, or, you know, when you're jumping between state and state, something um, goes wrong and you're no longer in a good state. So these are potential causes. And the way to combat that, sometimes you might need more human evaluation. That's always going to be um, the fallback. But you can also invent some uh, new mechanism to do model-based evaluation. You can monitor the drift. You can add more validation logic upon every output given the knowledge um, to make sure at every step the model is guardrailed in uh, expected behavior. And lastly, um, security and copyrights. This is uh, what I think 
it's some of the harder problem to solve. Um, you're, there are news about Samsung banning um, ChatGPT after their uh, employees have a data leak from using leaking Samsung's internal data uh, on GPT, and that's like a nightmare for most companies um, and a crucial thing to get it right. Um, you know, maybe people tend to trust bigger companies, or sometimes they would prefer to have their own open source model that they can control and train. And another kind of ethical issue here is copyright. Uh, a lot of the image models are trained on web data without necessarily getting the approval or um, copyright from the creators. So here's an example of on the right side, the model is outputting an image that have like a twisted Getty image logo. And on the left side is like someone found an original Getty image that look very similar. So this model is likely infringing on Getty images copyright. Um, they probably use their training data and that's why they're able to generate this, this thing. And this is something important for you know, developers of AI to be really mindful of um, so that the models are actually appropriate and ethical to use. With that said, that's the end of the session. Um, thanks everyone for listening. Um, and if there's any live questions, I'm um, going to be available here for, for a while. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Colin. So we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, so the first one is, my experience has been primarily frustrating as language models perhaps do not understand STEAM discussions, many unanswered questions. Why might chatbots manifest bias with STEAM people? With STEAM people? So S-T-E-A-M. Um, just quickly, Randy, can you maybe just clarify for us, do you refer that to like the STEAM gaming community or are you referring to a different acronym? Okay, so science, technology, engineering, arts and math. I see. Uh, so the question is the model don't respond well to esteemed people? Yeah. Or to discussions around those kind of topics? I see. Um, you know, it, it, it might be hard for me to understand exactly what conversations you had with the chatbot. Um, I would say if you look at the training data of the chatbots trained on general web data. So it's go not going to represent any community particularly well. There's going to be biases depending on which data set it's trained on. And specifically for you know technical discussions and stuff. It I also have a frustration that sometimes the chatbot is not going to go very deep. It is going to remain very, you know, superficial level. Like it's a good conversation bot, but it's not necessarily, you know, giving me the deepest uh, understanding how many solve the right problems. So um, to make those bots more helpful, maybe using the ChatGPT UI is not the way to go. Instead, I would, if you want to build something to help esteem people, um, this will be a better framework that would suggest to build something, which is you embed the knowledge that you're interested in, for example, like a, academic papers or um, particular technology blogs, and if you index them in a vector database, and let the model access it before it answers your question, I think it is able to capture those a lot better. Um, but that does require a lot of product building, for sure. Right, thank you. Then another question is, um, do you have any thoughts on who might be the most appropriate for testing and monitoring aspects that you have mentioned? Yeah. That's a great question. So first of all, um, I'm seeing a few startups in, in, in this field are heading into the testing and monitoring. Um, the two of them that I know based in, um, in the United States, one of them is called um, Arise AI. They introduced a product that can monitor the drift of model input and output embeddings. And usually that indicates whether you know it is behaving in a similar patterns that um, it did before. Um, so Drift can help you with that. In terms of evaluating whether the model is accurate and you know whether the model is going doing giving you inappropriate or inaccurate results, 
those are very early research work. There is a open air release uh, eval library for evaluating uh, models. That could be like one way to look into it, but I currently haven't found something that's like uh, very good and can cover most of the problems. So I think this is a very active area to develop. All right, thank you. Um, can you perhaps define the life cycle of AI or is the development phase distinct from the deployment life cycle? Any thoughts? Um, sorry, the question is explain the last development cycle. So the life cycle of AI, okay. um, is, do you see that different from like a normal software development life cycle? I see. And with AI, do you see the development phase being distinct from, for example, the deployment life cycle? Yeah, I think it's going to be different from a traditional software's development life cycle. Um, because for AI, um, we often, in AI, we often talk about a continuous, uh, I mean, software too, we talk about continuous development cycle. Mm -hmm. But the things that, you know, you have to pay attention to is sometimes um, you know the data changes like GPT are outdated after they're trained because they're no longer they're trained on the internet snapshot of last year and anything about this year's knowledge it will not have a knowledge for so in that regard you need to constantly give it fine tuning you need to constantly give it um, or give it a way to access new data so that's for the training and fine tuning part um, and what we just talked about, the testing and monitoring, the CICD aspects of software engineering is not very mature in machine learning. Uh, the best thing we could do is monitor drift or um, having human checking for it today. The, the, therefore, there's not a great way to do CICD, which I think is a very important thing to, to build and develop before we can trust it in production. And lastly, once you deploy it, um, you know, the model is going to be, going to be non-deterministic. It's always going to have um, you know, errors and potentially people will complain and the way to deal with and um, and it, it's sometimes non-obvious how to fix those bugs. On like software, you can change a line, you fix the bug. But in AI, you know, how do we change something? You have to give it more data, you have to try again and again to make sure it doesn't um, make the same mis mistake again. So in some way, it's going to be more convoluted in the continuous development cycle. Um, a lot of it is centered around data and uh, additional software to guardrail um, the development process. So it is more complicated than software. All right, thank you, Karen. So I just see there are also some questions around the slides. Um, so if you couldn't find it yet, similar to where you have seen the question pane or panel, there's also one with the heading handouts. If you click on that, you'll see the file that you can download. But what I'll also do from my side is I'll send out an email to everyone who registered for the webinar. Um, and this just also attach the slides for you there again. So I just quickly want to check if there were any last questions that came out. So just as the last question, as you mentioned in the moderation and alignment part, there can be some harmful, illegal or toxic responses, but th some things which might be illegal in some part of the world might not be illegal in another part. So mm -hmm. is it possible to train models for a specific region um, in a certain way, especially if you're going to use it maybe in multiple regions, but you may want to have a different response in certain regions. Depends on how we do the moderation alignment. I think um, if sometimes the moderation, like in these two examples, um, it requires a model actually to learn what, like it's another model that learns a score or learns to critique the, the model's outputs. And that model, you know, has a similar issue, right? It's trained on a particular data. It might be trained on the US law, but does not generalize to uh, the laws of other countries. So potentially you either, you know, train a new model from ground up, but that's likely gonna be expensive. Maybe a more likely way to adapt that model will be the critique model, will be to give it um, 
like I said, maybe have another vector databases and say, here are the laws about the model's behaviors. Um, here's a definition of you know, illegal um, or toxic uh, language or images. And um, you might want to train on a, a lot of maybe hundreds or thousands of pairs of example legal and illegal responses. You might want to fine tune it a little bit and give it access to um, a database that describes the law. So that way, I think it's I, I think it's very possible, feasible to a, adapt this mod, critique model to a uh, different country's law. But that's such a new idea, it's such a new thought. I don't think anyone has done that before. So it will be cool if um, something, some effort like this can show up. Great, thank you so much. So then just from my side, I would like to thank all of you for attending the webinar. You've been a great audience and thank you also for all of the questions that you have asked us. And then Karen, thank you so much for the wonderful webinar. I'm sure that a lot of you have found it really, really interesting and that you have learned a lot of new ideas and knowledge and information as well. So we appreciate your time and effort for presenting to us. And I hope that um, we will hear a lot from you again in the future. And Corin, just then also, if the um, people that are watching the webinar, maybe even later, have any questions, can they then reach out and contact you? Of course, yeah. All right. So then with that, I hope that all of you have a lovely day and we hope to see you soon. Thank you and goodbye. Bye.